have faith in God is not a stagnant state. It's a journey. As a believer, we should grow in our knowledge of God and His Word. Walk with Alan Cutting and many other believers as together we walk the believer's journey. Aloha and welcome to the believer's journey. And I thank you for joining us today. I want to tell everybody I just so appreciate your support in our ministry, your prayers, your comments, everything you do. I really totally uh, want to tell you thank you. Um, today, I, I do want to tell you we have, a, a, I think, an amazing uh, person here, Mel Fetchner. Um, thank you. With his uh, Bridge Builders. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about prayer today. I want to take a little note here real quick to say thank you to those who sponsor our program, uh, Allison and Thompson, Guerrero CPA, Guerrero Law, and uh, Trade Show Displays. So thank you for sponsoring us. Everybody, you can see them on our website on uh, www.thebelieversjourney.net. And uh, you can see a lot of other things. You can read about us. We have books that we recommend. and. Uh, missionaries that we support if you'd like to support them as well. Anyway, uh, I want to get going today. One more thing I do want to say. Uh, I am doing a uh, program on the Ten Commandments. I've already done the first one. I'm doing the second one starting next week. So every other week we'll have a new commandment. Yeah. And um, uh, plug into that. I think you'll like it because the way that I look at uh, the commandments, they are uh, those are given to us in response to helping us understand how to have a good relationship with God and how to have a good relationship with one another. And I do look at it a little bit differently than your traditional way of teaching. So uh, do plug in. Anyway, so let's get started. Mel? Yes. Good, good morning. Good morning to you. <laughs> it's great to be here. It is such a pleasure, I have to say. Um, like I've, we talked earlier, um, your parents, uh, Sandra and, and Ruben, are yes. wonderful people. I've known them for almost 20 years. Okay. And I've gone to uh, uh, part, of their, part of your ministry. They asked me to come and take pictures of, and be part of the group down at Wheatley Courts right. in San Antonio, Texas. And um, so I just think what they do and, and the continuation of this ministry is amazing. Um, so, and talking about uh, your ministry, which is, which is called uh, HIS, H-I-S in capital letters, Bridge right. Builders mm -hmm. of San Antonio. Okay, tell us, tell us what this ministry is. Okay, well the ministry started about 25 years ago out of Dallas with my twin brother. Um, <clears throat> in one of the lower income areas of the city and he was mentoring uh, one of the uh, young people in his Sunday school class and he got killed by a drive-by shooter and that kind of galvanized my brother and the young man who was killed Ramon's mother Velma and they started Bridge Builders in Dallas and over the years it expanded to a number of places and San Antonio was one of those locations and uh, few, about five years ago when my brother my brother had passed away. We separated off to become a, an independent nonprofit. Uh, but the work is basically focused on getting the gospel to the poor. Uh, our vision is a movement of God. We believe God has got to move people, move us, uh, uniting Christians across cities. So it was across multiple cities, and that's our desire that someday it would uh, continue to expand out past San Antonio. Uh, to transform urban communities, so we're going to be in uh, urban areas of poverty uh, through education, health, employment, and spiritual development for the glory of God. So God moves for God's glory, and then we have sort of four functional areas, the education, health, employment, and the spiritual, of course, the gospel and Bible studies and things like that. Now, when you mention that, I want to I want to stop here and kind of go through because I want our, our viewers to understand when you when we rattle off education, health, employment, and spiritual sure. development. Right. Well, we're, we're we need to stop here because when we talk about education, I mean you're you're doing mentoring, you're doing after school tutoring, you're helping right. with people in there with they don't have computers with their computers, mm -hmm. you're helping with their their schoolwork. Right. Okay. And that, that's, um, it's been a great component to really get um, connected to the community through the young people. Uh, since COVID hit, it's been even more important because many of the youth across our country and especially in our community uh, stopped going to school and a lot of it was online and they just didn't have that interaction. So 
Uh, when many of them weren't going to school, they were at least still coming to our out-of-school program. Uh, but there are also a number of youth that are not going to school at all, so it's very important just to give them some uh, social interaction. We always include the you know the Word of God, and we pray and spend time with them talking about biblical principles, but also to give them some academic help. And we have aligned our curriculum basically with the school district. We have some automated uh, curriculum that the school district uses as well. So... Um, we help them with their homework. or give, We always give them work to do. One of the basic principles we taught them early on that we continue to teach is in all labor there's profit. So whether it's education or your work that you do, there's a benefit. And uh, so we've tried to teach them a worth, work ethic and reward them. If they come regularly and they do their work, they get uh, paid money or they get snacks and that kind of thing. But the real change agent is the people who come and serve. Uh, who love on them and encourage them to do their work and help them see their true true potential. And we do education, but we also have uh, we have a gentleman that teaches some robotics. We have art sometimes and crafts and games and sports and all kinds of different things. That, uh, as volunteers come, some of those things get added based on their abilities and their, uh, their giftings. So we love to have volunteers that come and, you know, if you like to do something, bring it with you and we'll, we'll do it with the youth. Now, you have a website, and um, and for those who are watching, you'll see a banner come up with the website. Or if you want to go to our, our website, you'll see uh, a write-up under our guests with um, their website uh, and your logo there. But you, you say on your website there's 53% in your neighborhood there's, that you work with, there's 53% mm-hmm. of the adults that aren't even, don't even have a high school education. Right. So my question to you, because I didn't didn't get to read this, nor have I asked you, do you help these adults also with education and moving forward? We do. Um, a lot of that is more referrals to early on. We started with a GED program, and because there were other options, we would generally, because we're pretty close to like St. Phillips, uh, refer people to other organizations. But yes, any we will. If you ever desire to learn or get a job, we will basically help you try to. Um, get certifications or GED or that type of thing. But most of our work, just mainly on availability, is with the youth in the community. So another another title or another uh, area you said was in health. How do you help these people with their health? Health? Well, we have uh, the main thing we do on a regular basis is we have a, a doctor, Dr. Barabo, um, who comes usually every month at our monthly block party, and he does free eye exams for folks and then uh, he has also on occasion brought some other practitioners. We've had a dentist come out and do some screening and some general practitioners do some screening. So we try to facilitate, really we want preferably Christian medical professionals to come out and pray with folks and just share their, you know, their abilities to help do pre-screenings and that type of thing. The, The dentist actually after he screened some folks uh, basically referred him to his office and did free restorative work, whatever it was they needed. So it was very helpful to some of those folks that he saw. He took care of the whole package. Okay. And then you mentioned employment? Employment, uh, that comes in a couple different areas. Number one, we help people with resumes or job searches. Uh, we've helped some entrepreneurs in the neighborhood do bids. One gentleman uh, does construction, so we help them put together some bids for a project. And then we uh, we have some good partners that we've been able to help some folks get jobs directly with a Christian business or just encourage them to get out to work and that type of thing. Now, I also read on your website, and I know this for a fact because I've also come to your um, Wheely Courts to help out in years right. past. Okay. Um, but on your website, it also says that you uh, give free clothing, free right. f- free food, uh, you have door prizes and games, and you have uh, Thanksgiving, you have Thanksgiving packages or dinners, is Christmas you have backpacks, is it backpacks? Uh, for- backpacks for back to school and then okay. Christmas presents, yeah. So, so uh, and then finally, as you said, you know, it's about spiritual development as right. well. So, the one thing that I really like about your ministry is that it reflects Jesus, because Jesus Jesus wasn't just 
the evangelist to walk through preaching Jesus, right. preaching sal salvation. He was the one who went out there and fed people and clothed mm -hmm. people, helped, healed people and helped right. them. And w all the while he's doing this, he's also speaking of salvation sure. and relationship. Mm -hmm. So I, I like your ministry because it reflects Jesus in this manner. Right. Um, and so I have to say, this is, I love I love your ministry. I think it's it's amazing. Well, we Acts ten says Jesus went and preached the gospel and did good deeds. So we believe those two go together. Um, I think a lot of times in Scripture there's an and and we make it an or. So we believe those those two things uh, just are so that important to give them the truth and then also to. Uh, Show the love, and you spoke about feeding. You know, Jesus feeding people. Um, it wasn't until we were doing one of our Thanksgiving uh, block parties that uh, one of the partner churches brought us the bread for just 150 families, and it was in a pickup truck, and it was a bunch of boxes, and I picked large boxes, and one of them probably weighed 60 or 70 pounds, and I thought, wow, this this is just bread for 150 families. Jesus passed out to his disciples bread for 5,000 families spread out over a much larger area to get that many people seated and I thought that that was tons of bread plus fish that was a lot of work and it we read through it like oh yeah they fed 5,000 people but uh, that was a lot of manual labor those those 12 men would have been quite exhausted because each one of them was feeding about 400 families when we do that block party we probably have 60 to 80 to 100 volunteers just to do 150. So when you really get involved in doing things like you see in Scripture and trying to feed large groups, uh, you realize it's a lot of manual labor. It's not something that happened in a, a few minutes. But it shows people that you love them. And, of course, we always uh, share the gospel before we pass out the gifts or the the meals and that type of thing. Yeah. Um, so... You mentioned Dallas, and so you mentioned San Antonio. So right. in, in your um, description, that um, in fact, I have it here, uh, that you are uniting Christians across cities to uh, transform urban communities, okay? Right. So in your vision or in what has happened already, can you mm -hmm. tell us and tell our audience what is going on and what is your vision for sure. this Bridge Builders? Well, one of the things I love about uh, the ministry is we have people from churches all across the city. Um, like when we have the block party we were just talking about, we'll probably have representatives from 10 to 15 local churches that will come together for a block party. Or when we have the tutoring program, we'll have volunteers from four or five or six different churches. So the the workforce comes <clears throat> literally across the, from across the city. And our hope is that at some point, whether through our organization or just people who take the concept, I know there's other uh, missional organizations that have a similar concept of bringing the church into the community to affect it in different areas, whether it's education or health or the business community, um, that that concept would go to other cities. And I know there are places that happen. So, um, you know, our desire is just that God would help us to continue to help people see a vision of a way to do it. It doesn't have to be our way, but some way where, um, as you know, God told the Israelites, you're going to take possession of the land, that you'll take possession of a part of your city, your school, your community, and you'll engage with other believers to go and work to that end. So one of the things in um, getting to know you, uh, we have something pretty much in common. I, I um most of my audience and most people know me know that I go to Moldova all the time mm -hmm. and I I speak and teach over there a lot and I understand you also of course I've also been to Ukraine and I have a missionary friend sure. who, and I understand you've also been over there mm -hmm. and so your heart is in where mission missions are right. so it, it's interesting and the reason I bring that up with Moldova is because I I know that the groups that I work with you know, they have their goal. But in the individuals of these groups, I've seen them stop. And when they see somebody who needs a pair of shoes or a jacket mm -hmm. or or food, that right. they'll take from themselves and they'll give to these people who are in need mm -hmm. in that area. 
Um, it would be kind of neat if you saw the whole organization do this, right. but it's it's so heartwarming uh, to actually see people do this right. to give, even though they're poor, they're right. giving to someone right. even poorer. Well, the, the one of the pastors I work with in Ukraine, um, I would have to specifically, as I brought resource when I would come visit, I would have to specifically tell them, now this is for you. I don't want to go to anybody else. I want it to go to you and your family. And he commented, he said, well, you're one of the few people that said, you know, that focused on me as an individual and as a, a servant. But even then, it was a very uh, small church, not a lot of resource, and they were sponsoring a couple missionaries to Kyrgyzstan and just some other, uh, Kazakhstan and some other places in the, the former Soviet Union. So it's pretty pretty much a blessing to me to see even though he very had had very little he was still finding ways to help people who had less so i I, i've seen that uh, many and i think that's just the way we're you know philippians too we're supposed to look on the needs of others and figure out how we can try to meet that need yeah one year and and the way that uh, it's interesting the way that uh, happens when i go over there is um, I usually get a list mm -hmm. <laughs> of about 50, 60, or 70 items, you know. Right. And, and there's no way that I can afford to do this. So I, I put it out to the people in sure. that I teach or in my classes or mm -hmm. that I know. Um, and I just say, hey, I have a whole list. If you'd like to donate to, right. to this, we'll purchase it, and I'll go carry Take it, it over there. Right. Yeah. So one year, um, I was given a, in this list a pair of shoes. Oh, you know, and there were lady shoes, and I thought it was for the missionary, okay? But when I, I went there, and I went to this village, mm -hmm. I, I spoke at this church in the village, right? and so the missionary had, she had the shoes, and so she had noticed at the back of the church, handed this other girl the pair of shoes, and it had mm -hmm. me come up, and, and I didn't, you know, I didn't know what was happening except right. for that. You know, but I thought that was interesting. So the people here, I guess they don't realize they're not just giving to the missionaries. They're right. giving to the people they're trying to help who are very right. poor over there. I, th I think the word that comes to my mind um, when you tell that story is the word commend. And the book of Third John talks about commending others in ministry. And so anytime you give to a work or a missionary, you're commending that work. It, it's uh, it's also a reminder that by two or three witnesses, a man is confirmed. You're confirming that work, and then you're giving them ability to commend their ministry and their walk to other people by providing those yeah. resources. So, I also understand that you well, you have monthly block parties. Right. What is a block party? So the block party, we normally have a theme like this month. Of course, it'd be Christmas, and then. Um, because it's Christmas, we will, like you just talked about, we'll ask different churches and organizations to provide either gifts or funding um, for the gifts. And then we always have a church or minister that will preach the gospel and normally one that will bring um, a musical group, a worship team. And so we always have music that somebody presents worship, uh, you know, 30, 40 minutes of worship at the beginning of the block party and then Someone will usually present the gospel or give testimony. We'll have an invitation. And then after that part is done, um, we'll go ahead and give out the the turkeys at Thanksgiving or, or the coupon for turkeys or Christmas presents. While that's going on, we also have a number of booths. Sometimes we'll have other providers. We have a partner with Life Choices that's a, a clinic that helps you know women through pregnancy and that type of thing. Uh, they'll set up a table there. So we have other ministries that will sometimes pass out information to the community. Uh, we have a bouncer and a snow cone and popcorn and food. So we'll serve a meal. We have clothing that's available for people to just come and select clothing, shoes, whatever people donate. So that's kind of the first part of the block party. And then um, the, you know, the, the music and the invitation. And then part of while well, that's, uh, early on, while people are setting up, we also have a group that goes out into the community and knocks on doors and prays with people and invites them to the block party so that people in the proximity know that we're there. And, and But we've had some great just sharing the gospel and praying with people, just the, the group that goes out. And they may come to the block party, they may not, but just gives us another interaction to get uh, people out in the community. Yeah. And I... And I um 
I don't know if I've read this somewhere, but I also I understand you also have uh, is it weekly Bible studies with the adults? Right. So we have uh, we have a ladies group that meets on Sunday. Uh, we have a senior adult. There's a senior center there that has about 80 residents, and we've got about 10 or 12 that come very regularly in the senior center. We have a after school after the after school program. We have a youth Bible study, and then I have a men's group that meets on Wednesdays. Matter of fact, that's where I was this morning. And uh, that group is kind of the hub for our outreach and our evangelism. So um, that group on Wednesdays normally goes out on the east side to do door-to-door evangelism. Today they're taking some food boxes to the senior center and some coats um, that we've been collecting. And then Monday and Tuesday, members of that group, usually led by Donald Walton, who's our outreach uh, coordinator evangelist, he'll take people on the west side and then uh, we go to UTSA twice a month, usually on 30s, led by another gentleman named Rico Tafoya, and then twice a month downtown. So we kind of do a lot of outreach through that group. That's kind of our men's group Bible study, and then we do a lot. And then there's another gentleman named Tom uh, Villa that does a lot of stuff with us as well, goes to Mexico, and another gentleman named Richie that they all, different churches do different types of ministry in and around the city and sometimes down to the border. So it's a real neat group. So if you ever want to share the gospel, uh, like Tom, he's, he's been sharing the gospel, you know, personal evangelism for 50 years. I've been doing it 30, so I'm still still getting warmed up. Just amazing uh, group of people. We need more la- uh, languages. Um, he speaks, a couple of them speak Spanish, but on the west side, especially in the Cassiano area, there's, uh, Arabic. So if anybody speaks Arabic and you want to go share the gospel, we'd love to get you connected with some opportunities to do that. So I noticed on your website <clears throat> you have a, a place where people could volunteer. Mm-hmm. They can connect with you guys. Sure. And they have a, there's a spot there in a page where they can donate. Yes. So you have all that available for people who are in San Antonio. Right. Or in Dallas, mm-hmm. right? Yes. And, and if they want to participate and, sure. and donate their time or donate uh, finances or do, can people donate, let's say, their clothing or so forth? We do uh, pick up other things, clothing, furniture, you know, you just call and coordinate. We try to try to get it to somebody that will be, I mean, we've had people donate bicycles and, you know, all kinds of things. So we're happy to, however the Lord, you know, moves you to get involved, we're happy to try to facilitate that. Okay. Now I have one more question for you. And this is kind of interesting. It, it, I read this on your, on your website. It says that you've earned uh, a platinum seal back in 2019, the platinum seal of transparency, which is said to be the highest level recognition offered by GuideStar, right. the world's largest source of nonprofit information. So what is, what is this platinum seal? Well, GuideStar, um, like some of the other, there's several agencies that kind of review nonprofits, and they'll take a look at your financial, the 990 that you file with IRS, and then they added on some other criteria where to get to the platinum level, you had to give them some measurement, you know, some actual data on the organization. So generally... Those agencies, the more information you give with them, the more they will provide to someone who's looking to see if you're legitimate and you're using the resources the way the way you say you are. So that was, um, we just decided to go ahead and do a little extra work to give them information. And we, we do a lot of, um, you know, we do take some data and measurements because some of our, we do write grants and things like that. Some of them require you to give reports back and that type of thing, so... And we're happy, you know, my my greatest desire is that whoever gives would get involved. You know, Philippians, which is a book about joy, among other things, talks about, um, you know, Paul talks and he said, you prayed for me, you served with me, even one almost died and you gave. So my desire is that people would get involved and just come see for you. You know, the best, the best report is come see for yourself and participate and, um, you know, let us know how you think, you know, the ministry is doing. Okay. Well, his bridge builders, um, I, I'm really impressed. I think this is an amazing ministry. You can also go on their website. I know this is a, a yearly flyer, but I, but they have um, a PDF 
a newsletter I should put out every month. Can you yes. sign up for the newsletter? Sure. Yeah, you can just let us give us your email and uh, okay. we'll send it out. Um, there's go to that one of those contacts on the website and we'll be happy to. Yeah. Send so it to you. you want to get your church involved or you want to get your family? We, we most of our things are family friendly. We I got seven children. I've taken them to many of the things we do. I'd love to get your family, your church involved, or we can set up, we have youth groups that come every year. We'll tailor something specifically to your group. We have a couple of men's group that have come and set up like sports nights, events, and things like that. So if you have a desire to do ministry, I'm happy to try to tailor something for you or try to get you to one of my friends that has a ministry that fits what you believe God's calling you to do. Well, I know that when I went down to Wheatley Courts, the several times I went down there at Tanner more years ago, it was well organized. Right. I mean, you guys were organized back then in the early days. You started in 2006, right? Right. And so I imagine your organization, if it does this well, it's it's really organized now. And my, my dad and my mom and, you know, I've got a number of people that are very skilled and, and a lot of you know giftings to help administrate and so we try to keep it organized i guess one of the things i do tell people sometimes when people serve in a ministry they want to do something and really the most important thing is for you to meet somebody and to listen and to pray with somebody whether it's somebody in the neighborhood or a fellow church member that you know you're going to meet and maybe start a relationship with so the doing's important the being is is more important so but we do try to keep it organize and let people do something they feel like it's you know something they would like to do yeah well i i highly recommend if you live in san antonio and you need something to do or want something sure. to do uh this is this would be, this is a good ministry we to get got involved a block with. party on the 17th we'll be passing out christmas presents so if you want to there you go come join us we'd love to have you and for those of you um in other uh areas of the country and i and i don't know about internationally but th this is the the format is well structured, and that's why I said in the beginning, it's like Jesus. He he did this in such a way in his ministry that it seems like what you're following is what he did. Well, certainly that's certainly our goal. So, <laughs> so um, if you're interested, again, you can uh, get on the website on uh, their website there, and you can contact them, and I'm sure they'll be glad to help you out there. That'd be great. Okay, so our topic today is on prayer. And uh, Mel wants to talk, and we're going to talk about John 17. I think uh, the prayer that Jesus does in, in John 17 is one of the most overlooked mm -hmm. sections of prayer, I think, that are out there in, in the scriptures. And I, I'm really glad that you liked to, wanted to bring this up. And I think we. Uh, well, I had recently uh, studied through John 17. Actually, our men's Bible study at the ministry is going through the book of John. And it, to me, it's just amazing when you really study something, you kind of stop. And to me, I almost feel like I've never read the book. And then this chapter, I was like, wow, I've, I've read it before, memorized a few of the scripture. But when I started going through it, I was like, wow, this is, this is probably the most involved discussion or really communication between Jesus and the Father that is in all of scripture. And so it really opens up a totally... To me, amazing perspective of the, the the son talking about the to the father and the things he he speaks about in his prayer. Yeah, well, it's divided into three sections. In the first part of it, he he's praying for himself, and mm -hmm. so this is the first section. Second section, he's praying for his disciples. Right. And in the third section, he's praying for those believers for in us. the future, right. which would include us today. Sure. So. One of the really neat things, I'm just going to plug this in really quick. Um, in, I think it's verse uh, 5, Jesus actually says in here, if I could read it, uh, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I mean, he's claiming deity at this point. Right. People want to always claim, well, Jesus didn't claim to be God or any deity. Well, here it is, <clears throat> out of right. his own words. Well, we know Isaiah, um, I believe it's 42, 43, says, the, you know, the Lord will not share his glory with anyone else. So for Jesus to say, 
show the glory that I had with you before the world was shows that he is both eternal and that he is co-equal uh, with the Father. So this, the whole book of John, to me, lays that out so beautifully yeah. with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, I think that was John's whole... The interesting, I, I teach John a lot, mm -hmm. and so uh, the really interesting thing is John isn't like the other Gospels where it's chronological. John right. is like, he picked out 20 days of Jesus' life. It's, it's not a long part of his life. Yeah, yeah. and he just, I mean, just the, the last couple of days of his life is from chapter 12 on. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, Half the book is just a very short. Dead. But it's definitely loaded. I, I think the other thing that's amazing about this prayer, you know, when you look at the Lord, what we call the Lord's Prayer, there's give us this day our lady bread. But in this communication, there's nothing about the physical, really. It's all about the kingdom, right. the church. We'll see that a little bit here in a minute. And then God's glory, you know, that it's all about Jesus manifested the glory of God, and of course, he says the hour has come. He's talking about his crucifixion. So it was the pinnacle of God's glory on display was his willingness to love us enough to sacrifice his son. I think also, before we get into this, one of the things I like about John 17 is Jesus is praying in such a way to the Father that whether he's praying about himself or disciples or, or us, it's about relationship. It's sure. about, about the relationship, like with the disciples, they're yours. About mm -hmm. us, we're mm -hmm. his. Right. So it's all this connection of relationship with God because we are followers of Jesus. Yeah, I, I was sharing it as I looked through this when you think about, and I don't want to get into the discussion here, but you know, people talk about the security of the believer. When you look at the way Jesus talks about the believers, his disciples, it's it's this is something that's completed and they're yours and they're mine. There's a unity of this relationship that, of course, God is eternal, that this is not a temporary thing. This is eternal. He talks about none of his lost. I've kept them all. Um, and so in, in John 17, 3, to me, is a critical verse for when we say we're talking about a relationship because it says, knowing God, the one true God, Jesus Christ, whom thou sent, that's what eternal life is. So the essence of salvation is this personal relationship with the Father, Son, through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's a great place to take people to really share. We're not talking about heaven. We're talking about the relationship with the God of heaven. And I think that's, yeah. like you said, relationship is exactly what John highlights throughout the whole of his, you know, gospel. Yeah. Well, go ahead and share with us, and we'll go with that. Where do you want to start? Well, I want to, uh, there's just, there's certain principles in uh this chapter, they just talk about things of the the uh, kind of hallmarks of the church, and one of them is um, in verse 13 when Jesus says, um, "And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves." So one of the things that should be a hallmark of us, that, and the other thing that is fascinating is that Jesus ever lives to intercede this is jesus interceding so the things that he interceded for while he was here are he's the same yesterday today and forever he's still interceding with these same things and so one of them is that you know we would have joy and part of that is that we would think on the things that he's given us you know the joy of the lord is our strength and so there's a beautiful connection in this prayer between the word and joy and truth and holiness and uh, so it reminds us how important the word of God is to our walk with the Lord I, I think that if we look back at a couple chapters before Jesus does say to his disciples you know I came to give you life and more abundantly mm -hmm. you know, my joy is complete in right. you right. so I think that it's interesting that Jesus claims this with his disciples and he prays it to the Father right. So it's an interesting thing. And you know, if he prays it, that it's going to happen. That's that's the, the other amazing thing about, um, you know, this prayer is that, remember, he said, if you'll pray in my name, well, he's praying in his own <laughs> character, you know, his, his own glory, right? Yeah. Um, so you see joy. Uh, then when you get to verses 14 through 17, he says, you're not of this world. He's kept us from evil. Again, in verse 16, he says, you're not of this world. And then verse 17, 
uh, he says, sanctify them through the thy truth. The word is true. So he's speaking of the holiness of God, the separateness of God. To sanctify means both to set apart and also that it's it's holy or consecrated. So you see the Lord saying, this is who I am, and now you're to be like me. And the way we get that separation is to to live according to the word. And, of course, he says, you know, my word is truth. So he gives us that perspective that we're to be holy and that uh, one of the ways it allows us to do that is to be in his truth. So he's he's given us joy. He says you're to be holy, and now you're going to walk in the truth. And so there's this beautiful picture of things. You know, when we go to church, there should be some joyful people there, right? It shouldn't be shouldn't be a depressing place to go. It should be right. a joyful place. And one of the folks in my ministries I'll talk about, when he got saved, he said, I went to church and it was like, it was just bright. Everything was bright and light. It just had an aura about it that was totally separate from the world. So uh, it's a beautiful picture of uh, what, you know, Jesus has done for us and what the church should look like. I like I like what you said on uh, the word sanctif- sanctify or sanctification because so many people, and I totally agree with what you say. So many people don't understand the term sanctification. They, then, because they don't, they don't even look into it. Right. But yeah, it's a setting apart. So when we are sanctified, we are set apart for Him, right. and it's a cleansing, it's a purging. Right. And we are cleansed in holiness sure. to live for Him, and that's what sets us apart. Right. And so that's important to understand that because I think people shy away from that word because of other ideas that people bring out right. to it. Well, and we want to be living that way so when we go, because then he says sanctify them in truth, well, what's our message? It's the truth of Christ, the truth of the gospel. So we want our lifestyle with the joy of the Lord and the purity of what Scripture, you know, the Ten Commandments. What, what are those intended to do? They're intended to keep our relationship with God proper focus and our relationship with people honorable and pure. Right. So those are boundaries because of our sin nature that's going to cause us to stray. So I think this is part when we go with the gospel that our lifestyle matches the message. Uh, and, of course, Jesus was, in fact, holy and stayed holy and, you know, from eternity he's been holy. So his life was totally consistent with uh, his message of, you know, salvation. I, I think it's important to understand, too, of course, I believe and I teach that uh, when God created mankind, that he created us with uh, in his moral likeness and image, mm-hmm. which to me uh, defines the idea that who is God. First off, before we can know who we are, well, God is holy. Mm-hmm. And from his holiness, we have all these other attributes sure. like love and forgiveness right. and even anger and jealousy and mm-hmm. so forth. So if that's what God is and God created us in his likeness, Mm -hmm. he created us with the whole idea to be holy. And we were holy and we had an idea of of holy love and forgiveness. But because of sin and so forth, it's been corrupted. So we're told to be this. Jesus says, Jesus lives us. I just finished a teaching about how Jesus was our perfect example. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that he is holy and perfect, he we are called f- to emulate right. and and uh, become this. Sure. And I think this is this is really perfect. Well, you, know, you speak of holiness. The Bible probably talks about God's holiness more than anything else. You know, I mean, the the Jewish people, his name was so holy and set apart that they didn't even you know spell it with all the letters. You know that the history of the way they treated just his name. And so um, it's fascinating, though, in here because he talks about manifesting the name of the Father, and now we can speak of him as not just Jehovah, but our Father, and he talks about him as Righteous Father and Holy Father. But um, but the holiness of God is certainly uh, one of those characters, you know, God is holy. It's his, his character, and um, it's part of his glory, as he talks in here a lot about glory, which is, uh, you know, one aspect of glory is just the radiance of the Lord in heaven. Uh, that <clears throat> literally, if He revealed it, we wouldn't, you know, in our current state, we wouldn't be able to uh, to look at Him. But the other part is because of the holiness of the character of God and His love and His justice and all those things uh, that God displayed through Christ and on the cross. Um, to me, that's 
kind of manifest the glory then that and we're supposed to walk in that same character to love our neighbor and to walk and you know seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and then uh, as we live our lives and honor the lord it will bring glory uh, because of christ's character in us and being seen to the world yeah and even when we look at like in galatians in, in chapter five where it talks about the we need to walk in the fruit of the spirit mm -hmm. those those items that are listed that is essentially the character of god right <laughs> and sure. so, and those are the things I believe that right. were already in us to begin with. We that just need to corrupt in you exactly. And what Jesus is, and I <clears throat> sanctify them that they may be sure. sanctified. He is, and look what He's doing for us. What Jesus came to do to reestablish that relationship. Right. And in this prayer, He's he, not only did He teach that while He was you know walking through life with everybody, not just the disciples, but right. all His teachings. But here He's actually praying it as well. Sure. And I think that's really well, cool. Well, fruit of the Spirit, love, joy. He's just said that my joy would be in you. Love, we're going to see if we get, we'll probably get there. You know, the very end of this chapter is all about the love of God in us. And so you see him laying out some of those specific characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit in this, like you said, in this passage. Yeah. He's consistent. He's very oh, yeah. repetitive in some of the things he tells us. Well, so it goes from... Uh, his truth, and then we get, um, I believe it's verse verse 18, he says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I also sent them into the world. So you see the missional, you know, like the Great Commission, you sent me, I'm leaving, now I'm sending them. So we're, we're to walk in the joy of the Lord, the truth of the Lord, that character, the holiness of the Lord, and now we're supposed to take it out so people can, you know, see the truth of, um, you know, what it is Christ in us and the work of the Holy Spirit to, uh, to, like you said earlier, to bring the truth and then also those deeds that are in keeping with the fruit of the Spirit to love our neighbor as ourselves. And just like what I said earlier about, you know, the bridge builders, you know, that you're actually doing the works of Jesus by you know, helping those who are hurting or hungry sure. or needy or poor and all that and bringing them the gospel. Sure. It's not just, let me save you and, and say goodbye. Right. It's, it's, right. it's the whole package, which is what Jesus brought us. Sure. Well, you know, peace, he's the Prince of Peace. Peace, peace is not an absence of something. It's the presence of a fullness in life to be, you know, whole and to uh, have the abundance that he talks about. So... Truly, when we when we receive Christ, He wants to address every aspect. He's the Lord, who's our shepherd, and we don't want for anything, whether it's our next meal or peace when we go to sleep at night, or you know, things to provide for our family. Yeah. Uh, so then He sends them, and then He says um, the last part, uh, the last two, is He talks about unity. When we look at verses 21. He, and 23 he says that they all may be one as thou father art in me and these are things uh, you start getting into these what he says it's it's just something you have to kind of really think about uh, art in me and i in thee that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and then verse 23 i in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. We'll talk about the love in a minute, but um, you see this beautiful picture of the unity of the Trinity, and he's basically saying, well, as we are unified in you know, essence and purpose, now they're to be brought in with the Father and the Son into this unity of you know, like Philippians says, one mind, one spirit, you know, that type of thing, to really love each other. And we talked earlier about how he says, thine are mine, and, you know, we belong to the Lord, uh, that if we belong to the Lord, then certainly we should love each other and have a unity of purpose as we're sent out corporately. He didn't send out one, he sent them out. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things I love about <clears throat> the ministry that I get to participate in. I get to work with Christians from all over the city, you know, regardless of what local church they go to, I just love to see the body come together and do things corporately. It's a beautiful picture of that unity. It doesn't have to be all organized, but just those opportunities to uh, serve together, pray together, 
Um, you know, of course, every time you come together to a local church, there's a unity in that place with that body of believers where the body with all the giftings comes together and serves together. One of the things I notice in Jesus' prayer here is that he, he's praying in boldness, but he's also praying with a humility and a meekness mm -hmm. that's combined with this boldness. It's really interesting because mm -hmm. he's, he's praying for and with, and he's also right. asking. Right. And there's that humility mm -hmm. and the boldness together, which right. I think is really cool. Well, early on, I know um, he, he's usually asking, but I know... Um, uh, I don't remember which verse, but it's when he says, I will that they be with me where I am. So it's interesting where he says what his will is that... Um, In verse 24. Yeah, that we would... Yeah, I will that they also whom thou hast given me. So it's interesting that now it's the will of the Son speaking to the Father. So there's this... I mean, Jesus is always submitted, you know, early on in John. He says, I do what the Father says. I, oh, you know, I speak what he says, but... You see this beautiful picture where this sort of emerging, like you said, of him asking, but here he's saying, I will. And, of course, we know they're, the Father and Son are totally uh, consistent with, you know, the will of God, So because they are God. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, a fascinating uh, perspective there, whom thou hast given me. So he's talking about those that we have been given to him, because right now he's talking about... Um, you know, the future believers, those who would believe on the word of the disciples. Uh, the last, to me, uh, interesting perspective on the, the to me, the, the aspects of what should be in the church is verse 23 when he says, um, the last part, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And so to think that <clears throat> Jesus is saying, you love them, and this is the future believers, the way you love me. And I'm like, wow, only God who is love can love us <laughs> the way he loves his son. I love the way Ephesians uh, speaks about that we're accepted in the beloved. Of course, that's Christ, and God declared, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So when you put that together, God looks at us and he's pleased with us, not because of what we've done, but who we are in Christ and the, the love of uh, God in us. And then the last verse, verse 26, kind of reiterates the same principle where he says, And I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. So again, it's, the love, you know, God is love. The love of God is in us. And that's just something you kind of have to just, you know, all these things the New Testament says, in Christ, in Christ. It's just, you just have to kind of say, wow, Lord. So as a prayer, it's like, Lord, help me to understand the depth of your love in me and how that should affect me as I seek to love you and love other people. It's kind of a fascinating principle there. Yeah, and I think I think it's important that we understand as uh, Jesus. I mean, the way the way he's praying, because you know he told us in the disciples' uh, Lord's prayer. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he, being, he begins this. You know, Father who art in who art in heaven, hallowed right. be thy name, or your name is holy. And here in verse twenty-five, O righteous Father, mm -hmm. you know. Um, he really, he really prays with this, this uplifting of, of God. So, right. so he, what he told us how we should pray, mm -hmm. he's really emulating that same kind of idea. Right. In verse eleven, on that same line, he he says, "I come to the Holy Father." So when he talks about manifesting the name, he uses Father in here. He uses Holy Father, and then the one you referenced, uh, Righteous Father. So it's always a exalted picture of Father, but also the intimacy that um, we can no, now go to approach God as our Father because the the veil has been rent and um, we can approach Him in a totally different way than, uh, you know, before Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, people could approach. You know, it's interesting. I, I, um, I tell people, I have my class, literally, 
I teach this uh, class, and um, several years ago, um, I was telling him how I learned how to pray because, mm -hmm. you know, everybody says, well, you have to go in the closet, and they give you other little ideas. You right. have to kneel on your knees or lay down mm -hmm. or whatever. So I watched this movie called uh, Fiddler on the Roof, mm -hmm. and it literally taught me how to pray. And this is a prayer, this is a movie about Jews who are going through the persecution of of Russia at the time, ready to right. be kicked out of Russia because they're going, I guess, toward communism, really. Right. So, so the, the guy in the movie, he's talking to God as he's walking to work. Mm -hmm. He's talking to mm -hmm. him like this total relationship, right. like, you know, mm -hmm. his horse went lame. God, did you really... Did you really have to right. you know, do this? You conversation, know? yeah. And so, yeah, exactly, conversation. Mm -hmm. And I learned this, so I, I made my whole class say, you have homework, you're going to watch this movie. Mm -hmm. Of course, I had one guy, I don't watch musicals, you need to watch the <laughs> Turn movie. Turn the volume down. Yeah. <laughs> but it was really kind of interesting, mm -hmm. and, and so I believe we can learn in a lot of ways, rather than having the stigma of tradition and say, well, this is... You have to do right. this, whatever, because when we talk Put your about hands up and, you know. yeah, when we talk about what is prayer, prayer right. is conversation. Right. Jesus is basically having this conversation, and you can see the depth of mm -hmm. what he's talking about, and in all sincerity of his heart, with this idea that you know I am talking to my Father. Right. You know, and I, I think that personal nature brings it. Uh, you know, brings it to the point where all of us have relationships, you know, all, all of us have a father, hopefully they're still present in our lives, but um, an important relationship where you have, uh, you know, investment in each other and just that ability to speak what's on your heart. I, I also take people to Romans 8 when I talk to them about prayer, because literally, it says, you don't know how to pray as you ought. In other words, we don't really know how to pray. But then it says, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with groanings to do. So ultimately, if we're just willing to stop and have a conversation or listen, you know, Lord, speak to me, uh, the Holy Spirit takes over. And that's the beautiful part. God always provides, um, even in prayer. So when people say, I don't know how to pray, I say, well, just just." Let the Lord do what he wants to do. Then pray silently, but realize stopping to give attention to the Lord and say, I'm going to turn to you instead of some other option or some other thing is important. You're, you're, well, right at the very beginning of this prayer, based on your comment, it says, these words speak Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father. So it's that we're stopping and, he, you know, he's given a physical perspective of we're turning to God and not to our own yeah. abilities and things. And, and I think that, you know, so many people have a hard time with prayer. And I and I tell people, go to Isaiah, Isaiah 37, Hezekiah, I mean, mm -hmm. one of the best prayers I think is in this Bible. Um, he literally, he's uplifting God. Sure. He says, O Lord Almighty, God of Israel, enthroned between, you know, the the angels, mm -hmm. you are the God over all the kingdoms of the earth. I mean, he's uplifting. What does Jesus right do? Yeah. Uplift the Father. I mean, exactly. How would be thy name? You know? Exactly. Sure. I mean, the funniest thing is that in this particular prayer, you know, he's praying because the Assyrians are camped out around his city for right. a long period of time, mm -hmm. and the people are saying, hey, we just need to give in to the Syrians, yeah. and Isaiah is saying, no, don't Ooh. be a fool. Yeah. You know, God is God, we need to follow him. Right. Isaiah, I mean, Hezekiah, uh, being a righteous king, mm -hmm. follow that, but when he gets this letter, and we're going to destroy you, yeah. then he, he literally takes the letter, and the, the word says, he laid it across the altar, right? It's almost like he said, okay, God, this is for you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally. Well, like King David, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that, you know, challenges? Like, yeah, it's kind of like, hey, you know. Yeah. Take care is, of this. Here's a, well, he here, doesn't I even mean, say yeah. that at the beginning. Right. I mean, he says, you are almighty, you're wonderful, you're the God of all. You made heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. Give 
Hear, O Lord, and hear, open your eyes and see. Listen to all the words of Sennacherib. Yeah. And then he goes in, he's ridiculing. Look what he's saying about you. He's ridiculing you, God. Right. Is, he's ridiculing. Mm -hmm. And then he goes in, he talks about all what they've done and so forth. Sure. And finally he says, now deliver us from his hands so that all the nations on the earth oh, no. will know that right. you are the only God. Right. I mean, it's all about lifting him up, tickling mm -hmm. his ear, if you will, right. and then asking for what you want. Well, you know, um, all the way through Scripture, the Lord he said about uh, the Egyptians, these things are going to happen so that they will know that there's a Lord. And yeah. So and Jesus was his the fullness of saying, now let me, let me, you see him, you see me, and hopefully you know me that, you know, John 3, you'll know the one true God. Yeah. I, I think that um, the Gospel of John is, well, the writer, John, is my favorite writer. Mm -hmm. I mean, hands down. He's, he says things that are black and white. This is the way it is. This is the way it's right. not. He doesn't give, I'm like, well, let's give an interpretation. He doesn't leave room for a lot of interpretation. So I like John. You know. He lays out some uh, just the themes that are in the book of John, and then into the first, second, third first John, you see the same principles laid out a little different, but just very. You see the glory of God in First John. Uh, you see the fellowship, the Father, the Son, and there's just the First John or John one. The first eighteen verses lay out many of the you know light and dark, life and death, and just lay out some beautiful themes that just spotted through the book that just repetitively say this is who I am and you see the deity of Christ over and over oh. um, through there. And John is the best at that. Right. I mean that's the, the whole book of John is basically that's how he, what he points to is sure. the deity of Jesus and then in first John I mean he's over and over again you know he's talking about Jesus is right. as if God and we need to follow suit and love each other. Well, we, think of how often even in this prayer he says, you sent me, I'm sending them, you sent me. And then First John says, well, here's the spirit of the Antichrist. They deny that, you, you know, Christ came in the flesh, that he was sent from God. So yeah. he, he lays out like every angle of these certain things to help us understand the truth about who he is and, you know, what he did for us. Yeah, I think in, in John, well, the whole book is amazing, but in John 17, I, I think a lot of people read over John chapter 17 like they do in Numbers. Mm. You know, they just kind of read it, kind of, it's like a blank stare, and, and it doesn't have a lot of meaning, because all that was Jesus' prayer. But when we really right. look at it, what is he praying? Sure. Who is he praying for and how is Paying he doing for us? Yeah, it's pretty yeah. and the way he's doing it, it, it gives us the idea of how we need to pray. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like I said, he's he's praying in boldness. He's praying in meekness, right. in, in humility. I mean, this is that's what Hezekiah did. He's praying for people that 2,000 years ago he knew would believe on him that think of organizations and businesses and religions that have come and gone, empires come and gone, but 2,000 years ago, he's praying for us, knowing that we will yeah. still be, the church will continue to grow and expand and, and be and, and it gives parents and people hope to pray for their children and, mm -hmm. and pray for their friends and other people, because this is what Jesus did. Right. You know, and what I say earlier, we need to em emulate and become like him. Sure. You know, he is... He is, uh, uh, we need to be imitators of him and yes. become like Jesus. Have an expectation that others will believe on the word as it goes yeah. out. I had those pray for me and, you know, sometimes I wonder if they feel sorry they did. Some <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Because now uh, you are his and... You know, I know, it's just, I have stories. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's but, the beautiful part about prayer is that some of us have different stories, but at the end, God is able to... <clears throat> Saved to the uttermost, right? Yeah. So regardless of where we're, he's able. Yeah. I think it's amazing. I think it's wonderful. I think that um, if, if you haven't taken a look at John 17 and prayer, you know, read that chapter. Read it slowly. Read it with um, intent. Sure. And watch the movie, The Fiddler on the Roof, <laughs> because I think it. if you're having a problem with 
gee, how do I pray? What do I have to do? If, you, if you're in a legalistic mode of, I have to go in a closet and close the door kind mm -hmm. of thing, read, watch the movie. It, it really enlightens you and opens your eyes to the fact that, oh, that's what it looks like to have Jesus right. or God as, as a relationship. Sure. You know, and I think that's what, what's really good. And I, see, I think we see that in John 17 as well. Well, it's been good, Mel. I'm Thank really you. glad you came. I'm glad we had this. Thanks for me. Yeah. So, um, everyone, uh, do look up uh, the, the website. On, uh, you should see it on your screen or have seen it on your screen. Look up uh, or go to our website and you can see it under the guest. And look through their website. It, it's an impressive uh, ministry. And I think that he has a lot of... Uh, visions and guidelines that they've already taken that have taken place and if you're wanting to open something up yourself for that kind of a ministry or if you're looking for someone or a ministry to uh, volunteer or donate i think this is a great ministry so everyone thank you for joining us today and aloha